first we'll talk to a man who have spent a lot of time in baseball. He spent great seasons here in Atlanta, right when we were turning the page from worst to first, part of a phenomenal run. He was there in the early years, an 11 year major league baseball career, four seasons with the Atlanta Braves and even went 10 and two in Colorado, where usually the ERAs are about 75 for everybody. He now joins us, the free dog. Marvin Freeman joins us here in the locker room on the fan 680 93.7 FM. Marvin, thank you so much for your time and coming in here with the locker room folks. I was watching a lot of your videos on Instagram and it was just fascinating. I have watched about eight in a row. I couldn't put it down with you giving in instruction to young players. And the coolest thing is you taking video of you pitching and narrating pitch sequences, Tony Gwynn and some great players that you were going up against and teaching the art of pitching and not just mowing people down. Uh, to get right to it, what are your impressions on what young pitchers are taught? It seems like velocity seems to be the first thing that everybody's worried about and maybe not necessarily the nuances of pitching. Well, you know, by me working with so many youth pitchers over the last 15 years, um, I've seen the change go from guys that can pitch to guys that can throw hard. I've actually been at games where scouts were behind home plate looking at kids and they're throwing, you know, they're 14, 15 years old, they're throwing 87 to 90 miles an hour and the scouts are just like, just drooling. And I'm going, he's walked, the base is loaded. I mean, <laughs> what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. So I understand that a lot of times people think you can just get a guy that throws hard and then and fix him mm -hmm. so that he can throw strikes. But, um, me being from the old school with Leo Mazzoni and trying to blend both those things together where you can blend control and power is something that's really rarely taught because a lot of guys are selling velocity. It's a lot of velo farms out there, and um, I call them velocity pimps. I mean, once you get to a point where that's all you're selling, um, you know, the kids aren't really benefiting from it. So whenever I get a kid and I always ask them, what's the main thing that you want to work on and don't say velocity, it sounds like crickets in the room because they don't know. They don't know what they need to do other than throw hard. And once I realize and let them know that velocity is a way of maybe getting away with a few more mistakes, but now if that's all you got, you know, I hit a, a couple of home runs on guys that messed around and hit my bat. <laughs> it don't matter who's up there. You, you looking for a fastball, you swing with your eyes closed, they hit your bat, you, you, you can go ahead and do your bat flip and run around the bases like you've hit a thousand of them. That's what I did. We, we've seen that, and is that a problem just with the way that kids are taught to play baseball in general? Because baseball used to be where I grew up, a spring sport. We'd have football in the fall, basketball in the winter, and then when we got to, you know, March or April, we played baseball. Have we lost that now with everything that you're talking about? So many different camps, so many different AAUs, so many different everything, where people aren't really learning to play the game the right way. Well, it's turned into a money-making industry. Um, if you can play a tournament in December and call it the Christmas World Series and invite people from all over the country there to come play a 12U travel ball tournament and you're playing against teams from your own city and you've flown out, you know, outside your own state to go play a team that's two blocks away from you, it sounds good. Mm. You know, it's good talk at the um, office. You know, Junior had five hits, you know, and he had 15 strikeouts in three innings. I mean, you know, but you're playing against kids that should be, you know, at home making their Christmas list, mm -hmm. thinking about how to make Santa a part of their lives but you know with um the way baseball is and the expenses that um people have to pay it's it's just something that um you know sounds good former major league pitcher former atlanta brave marvin freeman joining us here in the locker room on the fan 680 93 7 fm and with that being said marvin from a pitcher standpoint how do you manage growing up and not overthrowing and not outthrowing and not getting arm soreness late in your career. Did, is that something you uh, talk about or just let those guys play and throw? Well, you know, with me, I, I try to manage um, the workload for all the pitchers that I work with. I take into consideration if it's um, the off season that we're not there to um, work on velocity. I don't ever have a ray gun when, um, when I'm working with pitchers because most of the things we're working on is the lower half and how to move properly because that's the thing that allows them to be able to cushion the arm, 
give it the chance to decelerate properly and make sure that their alignment and everything is keeping their elbow and their shoulders and joint in, in line so that they're not putting that added stress on there. So it's just monitoring what you're trying to do. And it's just like if you go out and sprint down the street as hard as you could every day, you're probably going to end up pulling a muscle. Right. But if you jog, you can do that at a controlled pace. You can throw easy. You can still exercise the arm, and you're still able to take these things into your baseball season and speed them up. So if you're always going at full speed, then something's definitely going to happen that's not going to be favorable. He's Marvin Freeman. He joins us here inside the locker room. You can follow him online or on social media, at Freeman Baseball. And uh, we'll get into your foundation in just a minute. The baseball stuff and the social media stuff you put out there is absolute gold. And it's inform informational, too. But I love watching you do the stuff that you do. Talk a little bit about this Braves team, uh, what you know about them, the pitching staff. Chris Sale coming in. Hopefully Charlie Moore can stay, stay healthy. These guys are getting old. Everybody's playing longer, it seems like, because of the way they treat their bodies and the stuff that they have. Well, you know, I've been throwing a little bit lately. And I, think <laughs> that, <laughs> I think that I might be give, able to give them one inning a week or something. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, those guys are getting up there. Um, you know, you, you got Strider. Uh, he can't pitch 50 games. Um, so we're just going to have to make sure that we um, – take care of these guys early, not burn out the bullpen um, early in the season because we're going to need them on the back end. Mm -hmm. And um, just try and, you know, baby these guys along. I, I wouldn't mind seeing the Braves come out with a six-man rotation mm. just to give these older guys another day. And, um, you know, we've seen Chris Sale. He's been dominant throughout his career. And um, he's got a lot of wear and tear on his body as well. So, you know, he's been throwing pretty well in spring training. I'm keeping my fingers crossed, and I'm hoping these guys will still be, you know, 100% come playoff time. But, you know, our, our job as um, pitchers is to get us there. And if we can't hit, you know, we ain't going to win anyway. So mm -hmm. hopefully the hitters will keep banging as well. Uh, talk a little bit about, uh, for me, having the quarterback, prototypical quarterback, 6'5", 6'6", 230 pounds, big, strong, son of a gun, smart. Ooh can move around, whatever, prototypical. So I think about you and pitchers, and I think about you standing next to Spencer Strider and how different that looks. Is there something to being a tall pitcher and a shorter pitcher and, and what that goes into coaching and, and how you talk to different guys? Well, with the taller pitchers, you get a different angle of attack, you know, more downhill. Your ball is changing planes a little bit more. The shorter guys, I think they can pitch up in the zone a little bit more because their ball is a little bit flatter. Um, I saw Strider has added a curveball to his mix, mm -hmm. something off speed to, you know, because his slider was 92. If, if a hitter is already late on his fastball and he throws a slider and is just spinning up there, he's just speeding up his bat. So he's developed a breaking ball that's going to make his pitches change planes better. But I think the taller pitchers get more of a advantage because – their um, release extension is a little bit out in front more. Um, if I can stride six seven and a shorter guy can stride five seven, then even if we're throwing the same velocity, I'm going to have a better perceived velocity because the ball looks like it's a little bit Starting closer. closer. Yeah, so that's my theory. Sure. No, I think Spencer Strider spent a lot of time after he got hurt. I don't know if he tore his knee or what he did, or was a maybe a Tommy John in college. Mm -hmm. He changed his his stride. And he it lengthened it by almost a foot. Oh, yeah. It goes to your point. It makes, makes it look different, too. Well, you could have come in here with uh, a 1,000 walks. You're 6'7", so you're one of Finn's favorites already. He has no yeah. use for a guy <laughs> six feet or under. Is Marvin Freeman joining us here in the locker room on the fan. 680-93-7 FM. The changes to the game. The pitch clock. You do have to adjust to changes in the game to make it more amenable for the fans to appreciate it. Uh, your opinion on the pitch clock and what that does or what it helps or takes away from a pitcher now that you have to get that ball to home plate in a certain amount of time? Well, I like it. Um, you know, most of the time hitters step out, they're adjusting their gloves, they're thinking about life in general. Oh, this guy <laughs> just threw me a slider on the black. What's he going to throw me next? Oh, that one's up under my chin. Let me get my head together. Well, if you got a certain amount of time to get back in the box, you don't have a chance to get those thoughts out. And I look back on some games that I pitched, and when I was starting, our games was two hours and 45 minutes. I mean, we didn't have a pitch clock then. So as a pitcher, it's an advantage. What I don't like is all these, um, the pitch calm is slowing things down where guys are trying to get it fixed and, you know, 
you know, the catcher is going out. He can't hear the. How sound. does that work exactly? Because the the pitch com explain what it is and then and how it works between the catcher and the pitcher and where everything is kind of going. Well, it's just like a series of um, numbers that you have on a wristband. Um, one fastball, two curve, three slider, whatever you got, whatever these guys are using, and then it's also a location. So, I don't know if the signal comes in from the bench or the catcher gives it based off his um, knowledge, but I've seen that a lot of the veteran pitchers, they give their own sign to the catcher mm -hmm. so the catcher knows what's coming. Okay. So it kind of eliminates the shaking guys off. But, I mean, if there's nobody on second, you put one finger down, I already know what it is. If you're going to steal this sign, it's, hey. Good luck. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about pitching, uh, you know, one of the things that annoys me is the specialization that's happened to baseball. There, there's no more guys going out there and throwing 140 pitches. That just doesn't, doesn't work. Do you like the way that that's gone where you have all these relievers that now come in and they're going to get their three batters and, and then they're done for the day? Well, you know, I think this is a direct um, response to when the Reds had the nasty boys, mm. Dibble, Charlton, and um, Randy Myers. And if they got to the sixth inning, you bringing three guys in that's throwing upper 90s, and it was virtually, you know, impossible for the the, the uh, other guys to to um, adjust to that. So I think that model has gone a little bit um, to what we're doing today. But at the same time, when you add that everybody is trying to throw every pitch as hard as they can, then you have to be able to nurse some of these guys through because. When you get to August, your arm, your knuckles are dragging on the ground, man. Your arm is hanging. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you, as a pitcher, you're looking for the end of the rainbow. So, um, you know, for, to have guys out there that's just trying to eat up innings and bringing in middle relievers that can just get outs, um, it, you know, I don't think it's exciting due to the analytics part of it where guys think it's either a strikeout or a... Um, you know, home run. Right. So if you're trying to strike everybody out, of course you're going to need some power arms. And it's easy to say, hey, this guy throws 100. Throw him out there. But if you got a guy, I like the guy that was um, on the Braves, um, Jesse um, Chavez. Chavez. Jesse yeah. Chavez. Man, he, he painted corners. He can go out there and pitch every day. And he's just the kind of guy that every team needs mm -hmm. as far as being able to eat up innings and take some of the load off those relievers that's going to be overused. So... The hitting approach, you know, guys that are in the eight hole are swinging for the fits. Everybody is strikeout, home run, you know, trying to get the OPS up. What, what, what do you think that would do um, to the future of baseball? Do you think that's going to change, or do you think that's the way baseball is going to be played for a long time now? Well, you know, they're trying to make it into arena baseball. Chicks dig the long ball. <laughs> the ends love home runs mm -hmm. and high scores. Um, it's boring to have a one nothing game to some. But to me, that's the most exciting part because it's strategic. You got to get a guy over. You got to be able to get a guy in. You got to make contact. When, when I see a guy say he don't mind striking out with a man on third and less than two outs, it just gives me more things that I can teach my pitchers. Yeah. So I don't care what the hitters do. I mean, I, I've, ha I've hated hitters my whole life. <laughs> and, oh, I love um, it. I just want to make sure that the pitchers have a plan of attack. And um, we've been attacking this um, uppercut launch angle swing, and it's been real successful for these younger guys. It's actually applying some of the things that they've learned. Interesting. And, um, you know, they're, they've gone on to college and pro, pro um, careers. So, you know, keep doing it, guys. Keep swinging for the fence. I, you know, you don't change your approach. <laughs> <laughs> He's Marvin Freeman, former Brave, here inside the locker room. All right, a couple of rapid fire. Toughest guys you faced in your career? Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> you did all I, right. I would say, I would say um, Barry Bonds, Tony mm -hmm. Gwynn. Um, the guy that owns me, he rocks me in the cradle, is um, Jeff Conine. Oh! oh. Cool. I, hey, man, I, I, I used to look at Conine, and I'm like, Oh, God. <laughs> I'd rather face Sheffield and Conine. They were batting bat right back to back. But Conine, I think he was, um, I think he read my mind. He knew every pitch that I was throwing. He knew where it was going. I think he hit about 800 against oh, me. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and, and, you know, uh, he's the only guy that hits more, that hit more than two home. He hit three home runs off me. And, you know, I keep a strict um, track of the body counts, mm -hmm. you know, the home runs that's been hit <laughs> off me. So when I do get a video out, I can at least find one that I got him out in. <laughs> Those videos are classic, too. At Freeman Baseball, intentionally hit anyone ever? Um, 
No, every time somebody's got hit, the ball's got away from them. Yeah, I'm sure it did. Greg <laughs> Maddox sure used to say the same pitchers. <laughs> you know what? This is what I say, and this is what I teach. Hates when it's out of my hands, it's out of my hands. You right. got to duck. I mean, hey, if it's coming at you, you're not going to let a car hit you. You're going to jump out of the way. <laughs> That's right. Well, you see it coming. So, I mean, only I like time that you theory. get hit, be, be an athlete. Uh, favorite, <laughs> favorite player you pitched to or maybe a guy you owned? Um, I hate to say it, but it's Barry Larkin. I think he mentioned me in his Hall of Fame speech. He was going, this guy, Marvin Freeman, I, I just couldn't get a hit off him. He was like one for 22 off of oh. him. And, um, you know, I, I like to say that, um, yeah, Barry, I'm your I'm your Jeff Co9. <laughs> That's kind of, no doubt. And then, did you have a favorite city? As long as you played, as many cities as you touched, either as a player or a visitor, food-wise, people whatever do you have a favorite city you enjoyed going to chicago you know that's where i'm from yeah um, every time i went to chicago i had a hundred people there to watch me and i never lost there i'm five and oh in chicago oh, come on. Oh. i got my first major league hit against them i hit a three-run homer against the cubs and it, look man i had a personal vendetta against the cubs because mm. they didn't draft me first of all. all right and i grew up as a cub fan and i used to cry when they lost back in the early 70s, and Fergie Jenkins and Ernie Banks, all those guys were my heroes growing up, and I was like, I'm going to be a Cub one day, and then they passed me in the draft. I was like, I'm going to kill the Cubs every chance I get. <laughs> now, you, you went to Jackson State. How would you like the fanfare when Dion was there with the football program and everything he brought? Uh, Dion brought a lot of attention to the school, brought in a lot of revenue. Um, it was great. Um, I was so proud to call myself a Tiger again, and then um, – once he left, I was like, hey, well, I guess I got to go be a Buffalo now. <laughs> I support Dion. Dion was a great teammate. Dion was all-team guy and, um, you know, great player. He, he, some, he talked about things that he would do before the game, and then he would do it in the game, and it was just incredible to be a part of watching him play for the Falcons and the Braves at the same time. And I, I, I might have been a bigger fan than the actual fans to see him land in a helicopter. We were like, Dion's here. He's in a helicopter. Oh, my God. <laughs> so it was like a movie, man. Right. It was it was incredible. You were part of the worst to first group. You come over, Russ Tanner's there, and we're in, you know, 60 win mode. And then the next year, we're in the World Series. What was that like? Bobby Cox being a manager, the rotation you had with all the Hall of Famers, with Smoltzy and Glavin and, um, you know, Greg Maddox. What was that transition like to be a part of the resurgence of the Atlanta Braves? And you were right there, part of it. Well, it was funny because me and my wife talk about it to this day. We talk about how when we first got here in 90, you know, we could walk down the street. Nobody would know you. We go get our own groceries and, and things of that nature. But 91 came. We go to the grocery store. The manager was like, no, give me your list. I'll get their groceries and we'll send them to you. So oh, I think yeah. we invented we invented Uber Eats. <laughs> <laughs> so we delivered the groceries. I'm pitching in a game in 90. is seven people in the stands, and they're going, Freeman, you're going to go back to AAA. You can hear the guy in the right field upper deck screaming. <laughs> and then the next year, you got 60,000 people tomahawk chopping. Your heart's pumping. You know, every game meant something. And it was just a transition that was, you know, I, I compare it to that movie um, Major League where, you know, mm -hmm. they went from who are these guys yeah. to, hey, these guys are all right. You know, so it was um, it was a great, great experience. And then to lose and then have a million people at a parade was just unbelievable. And, you know, those days still bring chills to me. When I watch those videos, I'm like, man, I, w I had the best seat in the house. And your thoughts on what the Braves are today. Battery Atlanta, everybody is trying to copy this. Uh, smaller ballpark, better sight lines, and everybody has eaten up Braves baseball. Uh, they were always doing that when the Braves were really a good product, and now they are World Series champions a couple of years ago. What do you see when you look at the Braves now as one of the leaders, not just what they have on the field, but just in how they have the fan entertainment set up perfectly for any fan around the country? Well, it's like Disneyland of baseball. I mean, you come down here after the game, you got so much to do. The area that's surrounding it is just still building. And, you know, when, when I moved down here, I told my wife, make sure we're close to the battery. So I only live like 20 minutes from here. So it's real easy for us to come over and enjoy this, um, even when there's not a game. Um, but just the, the area is um, great for baseball and it's the, the tourist attraction that it brings is um, we get the all-star game here next year and mm -hmm. you're really going to see it explode mm -hmm. even more so than now, but it's just a great environment. And, and talk a little bit about the Marvin Freeman Youth Foundation org and what people can look forward to and how they can donate and be a part of it. 
Well, the Marvin Freeman Youth Foundation dot org is a, is a uh, organization that me and my wife started about five years ago because we understood how the underserved youth were not being able to get the off-season training. A lot of kids couldn't pay for their travel fees because the expenses in baseball was getting a little bit high. And I was like low-key paying guys, you know, um, fees, sponsoring teams. I was sponsoring teams when I was on the Braves. Um, a couple guys reminded me from some videos that I posted. They were like, hey, remember I was seven years old. You sponsored our team. I was like, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I was doing some things long ago out of my own pocket. But it started getting bigger, and I started um, seeing how kids needed a little bit more support. We have a scholarship fund for um, – out outgoing seniors going into um, college. Um, um, we do charity events. Uh, we have a charity bowling event coming up at the end of September. It'll be our fourth annual charity event. And our sponsors have been really great in helping us do the things that we've been doing. And, and we're, we're, you know, we're still trying to expand. We want to try and make this thing as big as we can. Um, and, and basically, we're just trying to lend a helping hand and grow the game of baseball. And we're also, you know, making community servants out of these kids. They have to do s charitable events for to, to be able to qualify for some of these positions. They have to have a uh, 3.0 grade point average. Usually people say 2.5, but I want kids to actually really be locked in on their academics because, look, everybody's not going to make it to the major leagues, but if you're preparing yourself in a way for life, and then in turn have that same discipline that you have when you're playing baseball. Those things kind of go hand in hand, and you can't fail with that. Fantastic stuff. We really appreciate your time. Glad you're close to the Battery Atlanta and still close to the Braves, and we would love to have you in the locker room sometime soon and hopefully very soon. Marvin Freeman, we thank you for your time, sir, here in the locker room on the Fan 680-93.7 FM. Well, good to be here, and keep me in the rotation, guys. I, yeah. you know, I love yeah. to hear myself. <laughs> <laughs> Marvin Freeman joining us here in the locker room.